You know, I thought that this video could possibly wait until the world opened up and I could do something about this. But you know what? It can't wait any longer. I have to tell you guys about the Ozzy Osbourne box set and talk about my thoughts on his records as well. And I thought to myself, you know, it's appropriate. We're talking about a man who started his solo career in 1980. And what better way to commemorate the 80s than a headband? So without further ado, let's dive into my thoughts about the Ozzy Osbourne discography box set. And, surprise, I'm going to rank all of his studio albums from worst to best. If you haven't already, it'd be awesome if you'd like this video, hit the red subscribe button, and turn your bell notifications on so you don't miss out on any weekly videos I put out. Ozzy Osbourne is one of those artists that everybody loves, and if you don't love him, you probably don't realize how many hits he has that you know and do love. And I'm talking about his run with Black Sabbath and his solo career. If you aren't familiar with his music, it really isn't what it seems like on the surface. It's not heavy metal, hard rock, all the way through. He dips his toes into glam, new wave, and pop throughout his career. His unique once-in-a-lifetime voice provides a level of familiarity throughout his discography, while all of these players provide different instrumentation throughout the 30 years of his solo career. He truly has one of the most impressive discographies of all time. The See You on the Other Side box set is gigantic! This is a full retrospective of his career after Black Sabbath. It is 16 albums across 24 discs and every single one has a different splatter pattern to match the art. In addition to all those albums, this also has a flexi disc oddly housed on the front of it that has an unreleased demo. There's 10 24 by 36 inch posters and of course one of the crown jewels of this set is the Certificate of Authenticity. Yeah, good joke which actually is signed by Ozzy himself. There's also some augmented reality triggers that if you use your phone and a certain app, you can see some live performances. I honestly haven't really messed with that too much, but pretty cool. This is a hefty 23 pound box set. It is truly something you can lift weights with and feel like you're making progress. It's gigantic and it is beautiful. Unfortunately, mine did come with a sizable gash uh, right on the side where it says Ozzy Osbourne, which was a bummer, but they were kind enough to give me a partial refund that more than made up for it. Without a doubt, the highlight of this set is getting those records that are incredibly out of print or have never been on vinyl before. No More Tears and Osmosis Original Presses alone will run you close to the $500 price that this box set commands, and you get so much more in addition. Plus, for a lot of these records that used to be one disc or no discs that didn't exist, they managed to spread it out across two discs, which means that the fidelity is going to be much higher than being crammed all into one. I think this is a good point to say that this is not a sponsored video. If it was, I would absolutely let you know. They did not send me this massive box set. Wish they did. But that being said, I'm going to talk about each record in this discography, and I'm going to rank it from worst to best, in my opinion. And then I'm going to give you my thoughts on the box set as a whole and say whether or not you should get it. Furthermore, I will say I am sticking in this ranking to his studio albums. There's a ton of extra stuff included in here. A lot of live albums, some B-side compilations, etc. They're all for display for you right here, which is nice. However, I'm going to focus on the albums themselves. You know, nothing that Ozzy has ever done in his solo career can be categorized as bad. Some of the albums are just less inventive and inspired than others. That being said, I do think that this video will benefit longtime fans of the Ozman and new fans alike. So without further ado, let's dive in and get started with the bottom of the Ozzy totem pole and work our way up. Down to Earth. At first, this record was warped beyond playability, but thankfully they sent me a replacement. A definite decline from Osmosis and No More Tears, it lacks any memorable or new guitar parts or hooks and honestly sounds a little uninspired. I find this to be because Zach Wild, while playing on the album, didn't write anything for it. I enjoy most of Ozzy's ballads, but Dreamer is pretty cringy at times. This album feels like something contractual and forced rather than something that Ozzy was excited to make. 6 out of 10. Scream. Exit Zack, enter Gus G as the guitarist. It starts with a powerful opener, Let It Die. Let Me Hear You Scream, the single, is as crunchy and anthemic as his best material. Soul Sucka has some Alice in Chains grungy vibes at times. Sometimes it has a bit of a Rob Zombie vibe, which makes a lot of sense since Rob's bassist actually plays on this record. Overall, it's an impressive release for being this late into his career, but it doesn't really pull out any new tricks we haven't received previously, but it's a solid collection of songs. And also, a dead quiet pressing. 6.5 out of 10. Black Rain. 
My first copy had a piece of paper pressed into the record, making it unplayable, but again, like Down to Earth, they sent me a replacement. The final Zack Wilde album. Some awesome, ripping, heavier songs are on here, and the lead single, I Don't Wanna Stop, is one of Ozzy's most infectious hits. Mostly average, but what's interesting is that this album never had a proper vinyl release, and all the bootlegs prior to this were on a single disc. This is two discs, and includes the bonus songs, which are shockingly some of the strongest and most interesting songs on the record, particularly the piano parts in Nightmare and the entirety of I Can't Save You. 6.5 out of 10. Bark at the Moon. I remember shredding or failing to on the titular track on Guitar Hero, probably my first exposure besides Crazy Train to Ozzy solo. This is the first Jake E. Lee guitar work on an Ozzy album. Rather than the arena rock sound of the first two records, this feels a little more like hair metal, a little bit like Poison and bands of that like, than anything thus far. Ozzy being as talented of a songwriter and a singer as he is, it doesn't feel cheesy though. Slow Down does kind of sound like a stick song at times. Waiting for Darkness is a pretty great closer though. Overall, this album just makes me miss the Randy era, and it has some forgettable songs, but it's still a fun listen. 6.5 out of 10. Ordinary Man. Not included in the box set, because it came out after the set was in production, Ordinary Man is the 12th studio album in Ozzy's catalog, 10 years after Scream released. For a man in his 70s, Ozzy and his crew go harder than you'd ever expect for an album this late into his career, and frankly his life. While we don't get any Zack on this album, we do get Duff and Slash from Guns N' Roses, Chad Smith from The Chili Peppers, Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine, and on a less than expected note, Elton John and Post Malone. The album feels inspired and exciting compared to some of his late career releases before this, and is a refreshing surprise without a doubt. It has more in common with career standout No More Tears than it does Black Rain and Scream, which is certainly not a bad thing. Also, I got this record signed by Ozzy Osbourne a few months ago at Amoeba Music. No rest for the wicked. Enter Zach Wilde, who remained the Ozzy guitarist for the next five records. A distinctive playing style from Jake and Randy before him with lots of harmonic squeals and tapping. Definitely adds a unique edge to Ozzy that wasn't prevalent before. The album comes out the gate swinging and just hits you in the face over and over with catchy licks and riffs. There's an amazing solo on Devil's Daughter. There's also a fair amount of 80s cheese on here, but it feels so good and fresh. Side B isn't as strong or memorable as Side A, but it's all good. 7 out of 10. The Ultimate Sin. Ozzy can't keep guitarists around for more than a couple albums at first. This is Jake E. Lee's final album. The titular track is pretty excellent, and Secret Loser is a lot of fun. Thank God for the Bomb absolutely rips. Some aspects of the album definitely tread into hair metal territory, and it's vaguely Kiss-like as well, and Killer of Giants is the standout track. Shot in the Dark is a pretty massive single for the band, and one of the best tracks on the album for sure. This is Ozzy's least favorite solo album because he says it was produced to all sound the same. He's not totally wrong, but the album is fun and enjoyable, and if you're in the mood for it, it hits the spot just right. 7.5 out of 10. Osmosis. This album gets the most crap from Ozzy's catalog, and it doesn't deserve it. Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath plays bass on the album, for crying out loud. Perry Mason might be one of the best openers in his whole discography. I Just Want You follows up with a heavy, emotional track that eschews cheesiness for heaviness. Ghosts Behind My Eyes is another emotional ballad that rocks hard. I absolutely love See You on the Other Side, and it actually reminds me of a song off like Blink-182's self-titled era, sonically for some reason. My Jekyll Doesn't Hide shreds too. It's cool of them to include the bonus tracks on this pressing, which were absent from the single disc original. Zack doesn't sound quite as inspired as he did on No More Tears, which is why that album absolutely trounces this one, but it's still a solid addition to his catalog and definitely worth playing. The pressing sounds okay. There is a bit of inner groove distortion at times. 8 out of 10. Blizzard of Oz, the classic debut solo. Emphasis on classic, because it features the late great Randy Rhodes killing it on the classical guitar. Huge hits like Crazy Train, Mr. Crowley, and Goodbye to Romance. There are a few pops on my copy of Goodbye to Romance, but overall this sounds great. Side B isn't as killer as Side A, but the whole thing is a rock solid album with some of the best all-time Aussie songs on it. 8.5 out of 10. Diary of a Madman. 
the final Randy Rhodes album and features more of his awesome neoclassical guitar work. I feel like Blizzard and Diary are two sides of the same coin. Flying High Again is probably the biggest track. This album definitely sounds like the arena rock that Van Halen and Boston were putting out at the time, but with that Prince of Darkness vocal flair that really differentiates it from the competition. Diary of a Madman is an absolutely epic closing track that solidifies this album as incredible. 9 out of 10. No More Tears. The seminal Ozzy solo album in my opinion. So many of his greatest songs are on this record. Before this box set, it only existed as an overseas press with everything shoved onto one disc. Now, on this beautiful double splatter, the songs have room to breathe over two slabs. Lemmy from Motorhead actually wrote lyrics for four of the tracks on the album, which is super cool. Many of these tracks have a twinkly, magical sound to them. The production is top-notch and unique to his catalog. Mama I'm Coming Home is one of Osborne's most emotional, powerful songs. Hellraiser is just anthemic and sublime songwriting through and through. Zombie Stomp is crunchy and groovy, and the title track, No More Tears, has to be the most interesting and entrancing composition in Ozzy's whole catalog, especially with the colossal changeup in the middle and a killer Zack solo. Not a stinker in the bunch, an amazing collection of songs, 9.5 out of 10. I have to say, Ryan K. Smith did a terrific job mastering these discs. They all sound amazing on my system, and some of them have some serious punch to them. And like I said, some of these albums, No More Tears, Osmosis, Black Rain, they really benefit from having this two disc treatment, as opposed to just trying to cram it all into one. And if I had to say something negative, and I guess this is kind of nitpicking, the cover art feels a little blown up or undersaturated with color, a little uh, dry compared to the original runs, which is kind of frustrating, but not a big enough deterrent for me to not own this. Also, some of the discs come in black paper sleeves and some come in picture sleeves. For me, with a set like this, this expensive, I would hope that all the discs came in poly-lined inner sleeves, but that's okay, I replaced them with MoFi. Overall, without a doubt, the bang for your buck is definitely there. If you're a casual or big fan of Ozzy or you're looking to get into him, it's a little hefty of a price tag, but I promise you, this thing is available as we speak on the web store. It may be gone in a week, it may be gone in a month, but when it is gone from the store, you will never find it for $500 again. It is just too comprehensive and too well done of a box set to ever go down in value. So if you're on the fence, I think it's probably a good investment for your ears and your collection. Please leave a comment with your thoughts on the box set, any questions you may have, happy to answer them. And of course, let me know what your favorite Ozzy albums are. Feel free to even rank them in the comments. I'd love to see if my ranking comes close to yours. Thank you guys for watching this video. As you know, more coming very soon. Take it easy, stay safe out there. More vinyl content coming at you.